Hello everyone, today we're going to take another look at Pressure Advance. And this time, instead of looking at the kinematics um, that Clipper has implemented, we're going to look at a physical model of how an extruder works in order to look at how effective Clipper's Pressure Advance kinematics actually are. There is a ton of assumptions here, and this is really a simplified model, but the goal is to essentially show you um, what's happening in your hot end, in your extruder, so that you can um, better tune the parameters you have, um, which are pressure advance and also the smooth time parameter. We've really bounded this problem fairly well with the last two videos. The first one, we were looking at the extruder and how it um, moves the filament in and out um, of the tube down to the hot end. And then the last video last week was about the flow and how much force re was required to push filament out at a given flow rate. Um, what we're really missing though is what's in the middle. If this was essentially a perfectly rigid um, kind of structure, the extruder would push filament at a given speed and that exact same volume of filament would come out of the nozzle um, instantly. However, there's um, springiness and compliance in any system, any physical uh, part, and we need to account for that. How we do that is by essentially um, equating this to a big spring. And springs are, um, you know, in general linear objects. Um, they have a spring constant and they um, output a force based on how much the spring is compressed or extended. We're going to assume a linear model here. Um, it's not going to you know, get harder to push the, the more you uh, compress it. Um, that's probably not accurate, but in the case of our simplified model for today, um, that is sufficient. So again, springs are based on um, kind of the spring construction and how much you compress it. And then if the spring is compressed, it's going to exert a force um, in both directions because we have equal and opposite interactions here. The first one is going to exert a force up against the extruder and the extruder has to resist that force, um, and that requires torque from the extruder motor. As long as the extruder can, can sustain that force that it is experiencing, um, the spring will exert the same force down onto the melt zone with the melted plastic, and that force can be, then be converted into flow, and based on the uh, equation we defined last week. So, um, with all this in mind, let's take a look at the model itself. On the left, we're going to have two things. One is the extruder position and how it pushes the filament into the essentially springy zone. Um, and then the orange line at the bottom will represent flow going into the melt zone of the hot end. So we're going to move the extruder by 0.1 millimeters in this first time step. And you can see that the spring has compressed slightly because um, no flow has occurred at the hot end yet. Um, so that filament in between the extruder and the hot end has been slightly compressed. That um, compression is going to create a force. And in this case, um, we're going to assume a spring uh, constant of 70 newtons per millimeter. And there is reasons why I picked this value. Um, and I may get into an entirely different video of how to estimate that. Um, but for now, just assume um, that I know what I'm talking about. Um, so 70 newtons per millimeter times the change in position from kind of a, a, a relaxed length. So we've just squeezed one end by 0.1 millimeters and the other end has been stationary. Um, so we have 0.1 millimeters of change in length. So 70 newtons per millimeter times 0.1 millimeters equals a, a spring force of 7 newtons. From past experience, seven newtons isn't that much force for an extruder, so we're gonna assume that the extruder can maintain its position um, under seven newtons of force. Once we have that uh, force, then that force is uh, compressing the melted plastic in the hot end. And based on the characterization of some hot ends from last week, um, here's the formula I have uh, for one of my hot ends. Um, my assumption is that it will push about 3.9 cubic millimeters of uh, filament per second out of the nozzle. Now we need to know how much the uh, plastic that is going into the melt zone actually moves. Um, so in this case, um, we're going to look at the amount of flow that has happened in this time step. So um, a flow rate of 3.9 cubic millimeters per second 
times a time step of 0.1 seconds um, divided by the cross-sectional area of a 1.75 millimeter uh, piece of filament um, means that the filament has gone into the uh, melt zone on the hot end by 0.016 millimeters. The first thing that should stick out to you is that we move the extruder by 0.1 millimeters, but the plastic only moved into the melt zone by 0.016 millimeters. So that means that in this case, if we were printing an object, um, this area would be under, under extruded because we got way less plastic than we actually were requesting. Taking this step forward um, to the next step, we're going to assume the extruder is maintaining its position for the next 0.1 mil or 0 0.01 mil uh, seconds. So in this case, we're not extruding any uh, plastic, or we don't want to, um, but that spring force is still there. It is slightly reduced because um, the extruder is holding at 0.1 millimeters, um, but 0 0.016 millimeters of plastic has oozed out of the uh, the nozzle as shown by this little um, bit of, of uh, orange line here. And so the spring force is slightly reduced to 5.88 newtons. Our flow rate is also reduced um, because there's less force. And then our output distance, um, again, is slightly smaller as well. So in this te second time step, we wanted no flow rate, but we actually still got a small amount of flow of the nozzle. So in this um, instance, assume we're going around a corner and the extruder is stopping, we're still going to get more plastic than we actually want. And so during this time step, we're actually over extruding. So we'll have bulging or other uh, kind of print defects like that. So um, if we take this same basic step-by-step uh, -step iteration um, and carry it through a lot of time steps, we end up getting this. So at the beginning, the extruder position jumps up by 0.1 millimeters and stays there. And then the plastic uh, equivalent plastic distance that has gone out of the hot end um, gradually increases until it reaches a steady state where once these two lines uh, meet, there is no force um, being exerted on that melted plastic. So none should ooze out. The important thing again is that any area between these two lines in this case means that we are under extruding for this entire period. So that is not desirable and we want to fix this. And this is what pressure advance does. But um, this is a really basic model, a basic step uh, example where we're just doing a single extrude move. Let's take this to another level um, and go back to the first um, kind of model we did in the extruder 101 video where the tool head was stationary it increased at a given acceleration until it reached a certain speed or flow rate, held at that flow rate for a given amount of time, and then decreased back to zero. And this kind of trapezoidal shape is um, very standard clipper kinematic um, movement. It's very standard. So we want the exact amount of plastic um, to be extruded to match this green profile, because if it's exactly on top of this, what actually happens that means that our part will be perfectly extruded the whole way through. Now, we know that's not going to be the case though. So if we add on the same uh, calculations from the last example, but um, without any pressure advance, we see that during the initial part of this extrude move, we're dramatically under extruding all the way here. We're not, um, we don't have as high of a flow rate as we need. And actually significantly so, that's a lot less than we, we want. But then at the end where the tool head starts slowing down, we have all of this excess plastic um, that's getting extruded even well after the tool head stops. So in this case, there's going to be a bulge or, or over extrusion. So both of these are bad. Um, if you remember all of the extruder math and calculations we've done with pressure advance and smooth pressure advance, um, you'll know that we uh, uh, kind of comp uh, compensate for that. And um, this blue line is actually what ends up happening um, using the smooth pressure advanced parameters that basically match this um, kind of case. You'll note it's not perfect um, because there's still some um, over extrusion here and here, a little bit over over extrusion here, but then 
Um, in general, the amount of over extrusion if you, and under extrusion, if you look at the areas of these points along the way, are substantially reduced versus these massive uh, kind of areas um, between the uh, green and orange lines. So this is the magic of pressure advance and why we, why we use it, because we want to make sure that all parts of our 3D printed uh, components are properly extruded. The critical thing though is to make sure that your parameters are chosen accurately. And um, one of these things that we can do in this case would be possibly um, reducing the smoothing time if our extruder can handle it um, so that we reduce some of this, um, you know, this time that is extruding before we actually want it to extrude and likewise uh, these parts here. So in this case, um, probably we can improve our response even better by reducing our smooth time. So this was really cool for me because I you know, knew what pressure advance was, but um, actually trying to build a step-by-step -step transient model um, turned out a lot cooler than I expected. Um, there's a lot going on here yet. Um, and again, this is just a single example. I want this model to be scalable so we can see for a given set of um, say spring constant, um, pressure advance select, uh, selections, how we are over extruding or under extruding at different flow rates and speeds, um, and then allow you to basically adjust the model to your heart's content. At this point, the model is really um, ugly. It's, it's not easily uh, manipulatable, and uh, so I'm not going to release it yet, but I'm still working on getting to that point. Um, you know, in the future, I still want to look at the other component of that, this, which is we have the force throughout the entire time steps of, of the um, extrude moves and different uh, speeds and things like that. So now we can properly uh, map all of the uh, force or torque of the extruder uh, stepper sees. And so that's probably the next video, um, but we'll see if there's anything else interesting that pops up before then. Um, if there's any specific area of this you want me to explain more or um, dive deeper, Feel free to reach out, leave a comment. Um, I, you know, I'm curious to see where you guys um, want me to continue on in the future. So, hope you enjoyed it, and until next time.